Hey, welcome to our live roundtable discussion of the NFL protest. Now, we're talking about the decision first to sit and then later to kneel during the national anthem that was started a year ago by former 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick and all the events that have unfolded since that time. And tonight, we're bringing together people on opposite sides of this controversy. First, let me say that every time I see one of these debates online, they are nasty, they're loud, they're rude, they serve, in my opinion, no useful purpose. And so tonight, for a change, we're going to have a civil discussion and talk about how the country moves forward. We do want you to join us. Our digital journalist, Alicia Ibrahimji, will be taking your questions from Facebook Live. And again, we'll take no questions, no comments that are demeaning or derogatory. There are plenty of places online for you to have your rant. This is not going to be one of them. We do want uh, you to be part of a real conversation. So now, let's get to our panel if we can. I'm joined by Dale Hansen, our sports anchor here at WFAA, who has made uh, pretty clear his belief that the athletes have the right to kneel. From the Dallas Police Department, veteran officer Mike Mata is here. He's a very strong voice in support of officers for quite some time. Attorney Jasmine Crockett, who has represented clients who have accused officers of excessive force. Conservative political analyst, lawyer, and radio host Debbie Georgiatos is with us tonight. She believes all who are able should stand during the anthem. The Reverend Dr. Frederick Haynes, pastor of Friendship West Church in Dallas and a supporter of NFL athletes who kneel. And then two Armed Forces veterans on opposite sides of the issue, they're with us, Ernest Walker is an Army veteran who is also a supporter of Black Lives Matter. And Clark, excuse me, Clark Gillette, who served in the Marine Corps during Desert Storm. I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, tonight. I want to uh, start, if we can, with, with the veterans tonight. Uh, Ernest, uh, you know, a lot of the supporters of the athletes have said that what's happened really with this entire thing is that the issue itself has been hijacked. It's no longer is there discussion about what really started this and what the real issue was at first. Tell me about that. you feel that way? Uh, yes, I do. And uh, that's indicative of the NFL owners having a meeting and trying to discuss ways to avert the, the problem rather than address the problem. Um, and so, you know, it has turned into, you know, whether you should kneel or not kneel or about to flag when uh, it's really about people like in Dallas alone, Jordan Edwards, who was killed by an unarmed cop, or, or people like, you know, Mike Brown and the Trayvon Martins of this, of this world that uh, feel like that there's a sense of uh, just us and not, we're not included in this system. So, uh, yes, I, I feel like that it's been skewed and we need to get it back on track. Uh, Clark, let, let me ask you this. Um, you don't have a real concern about the fact that there's, there is an issue that needs to be discussed. Your concern is what, the venue that they're taking, the fact that this is occurring during the anthem? Is that, is that a concern that you have? It is. And, you know, uh, Vietnam was a very unpopular war. They came back. They didn't have a lot of support. Fast forward to the Persian Gulf War that I was in. There was a ribbon on every tree. I remember... Um, the 91, I think it was Tampa Bay Super Bowl, that Whitney Houston uh, sang a very memorable uh, anthem, and it was uh, it's heralded as one of the best anthems ever s sung. Um, and there were people in the crowds that said, "Welcome home, troops!" and um, "God bless the troops!" and everybody had a flag, and it, and that is pivotal to the morale of the troops overseas. So. Uh, fast forward to today, and uh, people forget that we've been in a war for over a decade. And um, I think the venue, I don't disagree with uh, um, protesting. I disagree with the way in which they decided to protest. So um, I think uh, the anthem is something that um, brings us together. It's something that we can agree on. and stand beside each other regardless of a race and uh, I think there's better ways to protest so um, you know the folks came back from Vietnam and, and I deal with veterans and uh, we, what's the thing that we say to a Vietnam veteran welcome home because they didn't get the welcome home originally um, and then you fast forward to, to the Persian Gulf War we we were just overwhelmed with patriotism and we were very successful in that war. And I see that as a direct result of support at home. So, um, 
I can remember when Whitney Houston sang that, I can remember getting tears in my eyes. Troops need support. And when you, when, when they're sitting over in a tent in Kandahar and they're watching a game at 3 p.m., you know, 3 a.m. in the morning, um, they need to see that the country is behind them. So, Well, Je Jasmine, let, let me ask you uh, quickly. Uh, you support the troops. You, you believe that the families do support the troops, uh, but this really isn't about the troops. This is about some of the clients that you've had to, that you have had to uh, represent. Absolutely. Um, Ernest brought up Jordan Edwards, and that case is, is probably the case that's nearest and dearest to my heart, being that he was a 15-year-old that was gunned down with an AR-15, um, and all he was doing was riding as a passenger in his big brother's car, leaving a party. He had not used drugs. He had not uh, drank anything. He hadn't done anything wrong. And so the issue with a protest is that it has to make people uncomfortable. If we protest and everybody's okay with it, it's ineffective. So it does have to take people to this level of discomfort. So I do think that the right venue is for the anthem. And on top of that, it's not about the troops whatsoever. This is all about police brutality. And so I think that what's happened is the, the dialogue has been switched. Kaepernick never said that this was about the troops. Not once. And he is the one that started this. And he actually sat down with a serviceman who said, hey, you know what, take a knee. Now, there are people, I've got Pastor Haynes that's shaking his head. There are people that talk about when we go to church, a lot of times when we get down on our knees, that's in reverence to the Lord to pray. So to say that it's disrespectful and to not even evaluate the fact that we have people that have a constitutional right versus a song. At the end of the day, our constitutional rights are always going to measure up and be a higher level than, than the song itself. De Debbie, let, let me ask you this. Uh, my understanding is that Colin Kaepernick originally sat during the anthem, and that what happened was he's had a discussion with uh, a Green Beret who didn't like him sitting during the anthem. They agreed, apparently had a con come to a consensus that perhaps he should kneel uh, during the anthem, and that would be something that was more appropriate. But you have a difficulty with him doing either one of those things during it? You know, I really do. My overall sense about this protest is, is it, it's a major message misfire. I think that there are the instances that were alluded to earlier. There, everyone can point to things where, where things were done that were not right by police officers. And even the broader question, which Colin Kaepernick did mention in an early statement, about this country having being filled with racism. No one is saying that America is a perfect place and that there's no racism here at all. But the thing about the flag and the anthem, they're the one unifying thing about America. And the reason I say this is a mess, it's a unifying thing we all get behind, whatever our politics, our religion, America, the flag, the anthem is our unifying thing. And I think what's happened in this protest is because there have been Colin Kaepernick's comments earlier and then other players making different remarks, it feels like a general statement and an attack on America as a broadly, a broad attack on America as a racist country. And most of the fans feel like it's an accusation of everyone. It's an accusation against the whole country. And most people's re answer is kind of, not guilty. That's not who we are. This, this, the individual instances that need investigating, we should do that. When you have to correct behavior by police officers or others, we should do that. But it's a, the, the, just not, the disrespect for the flag, the one symbol that should bring us all together. And frankly, football brought people together so much. I think this is reason, this is the reason the customers, the uh, audience, the fans are turning away is because they feel personally accused and they, they're saying not guilty. That's not who we are as a country. We all agree we're not perfect, but this broad accusation against all of America is not playing well to the fans. You're joining us, of course, on Facebook Live. I'm going to get to those in just a moment. I want to ask uh, uh, Pastor Haynes. Uh, you believe, however, that uh, perhaps the, the athletes are the ideal people to bring this to the country's attention. Oh, without question. Uh, our country has a rich history of activism to make America a more perfect union. And our country has often done their activism at inconvenient times. 
The Boston Tea Party was not convenient. The march on Washington, as much as we look back on it now through the eyes of rose-colored glasses, was not convenient. As a matter of fact, when you look at the sit-in movements, none of those protest movements that have made America progress were ever better. And there were, as a matter of fact, 60% of those who are Americans were against the March on Washington. Today, that would not be the case. And so I'm asking us to consider the fact that protests have never been convenient. As a matter of fact, I would even say with Debbie, it's not just the flag it's the message of the flag, the message of the flag, liberty and justice for all. That's what we agree upon. And that's what inspires us to stand against anything that contradicts liberty and justice for all. So I believe that the athletes are doing what America represents when it is, when it is at its best. And so last year, Muhammad Ali passes. And Muhammad Ali is looked now as this great saint all most. But Muhammad Ali, when he took his stand against the war in Vietnam, he was demonized and vilified. And so protests are never convenient. They never have been. John Carlos and Tommy Smith, when they took that stand after the 200 meters uh, there in Mexico City, uh, they were demonized, vilified. But again, history shows that they were the ones who were doing what was right as they symbolically protested poverty and the absence of racial justice in this country. So we have a rich history in this country on every side of taking a stand for what's right, protesting for what's right, and it's always been inconvenient. And the beautiful thing is, and I love this, athletes who have a voice, who have a platform, use that voice and platform for those who have no voice and platform. And I'll say this right quick, Martin Luther King Jr., who we revere today, was a middle class preacher who used his platform to protest injustice in America. They are standing in that same tradition. Let me ask you, Mike, uh, mm -hmm. there have been some who have been concerned that the reaction to this entire movement by admittedly few individuals has been, has been the res, has resulted in police officers who have actually gotten killed. I'm thinking of the five officers in the Dallas area. Right. I'm thinking of the officers in uh, Louisiana a couple in New York. Uh, that's the concern that, that you're hearing from officers, I understand. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a wide, wide uh, belief because, you know, people who have evil in them, they have evil in them already. You know, they had it in them before right. those incidents occurred. They had hate for man, hate for any man, Thank you. and choose to shoot people at will. So I don't think the, the message that was being sent, whether it's through Black Lives Matter or, or whatever group, Thank pushed you. this individual to, today I'm going to go kill five cops. Now, there was messages that was throughout the nation that didn't help, but that individual had his mindset. And whether it was going to be that day, it might have been another day That's or farther right. down the way. Um, I've heard everything, y'all, and, and I agree with almost everything that has been said. I think we just need to make sure that the right message is being sent. You know, um, for an example, you know, here in the city of Dallas, we're going to have probably about 1.3 million contacts between the police and the citizens. 1.3 million times. And that's just between calls, flag downs, traffic stops, things that can be calculated through computer programs or whatever over the radio transmit. And during that time, as of right now, we've had seven police shootings. And of those seven police shootings, four of them had guns and weapons. So in the city of Dallas, and overall, I think overall in the criminal justice system, this is not a systemic problem. Do we have a problem? Absolutely we have a problem. We have a failure in training. We always need more training in the police uh, profession. Um, but we also got to understand that officers are out there <clears throat> making very hard decisions right. in split seconds and then we have months, years and forever to, to diagram it, to look at video, to look at those, those dimensions that that officer doesn't have the ability to look at. And then we decide in those long period of times whether this officer made a correct decision in a split second. So should we as a profession be held accountable? Absolutely. But should we also understand that the profession that we chose the profession that we chose to protect the public isn't easy and it's not pretty. Violence is never pretty. It was never created to be pretty. It's a form of, in, uh, it's a form of uh, uh, to get somebody to do what we need them to do. And more often than not, officers use way less force than they're authorized to use and we get hurt more often now than we ever did before because it's almost like we are uh, timid to do the right thing and just put them in handcuffs. We try to talk ourselves out of a situation when what you need to do is just go ahead and put handcuffs on them. 
because everybody talks about we need training to try and degress, to de-escalate. Absolutely we do. The problem is you need two parties that are willing to de-escalate a situation. It doesn't just work if an officer wants to de-escalate it, if the other person chooses not to. At some point, somebody has to put handcuffs on somebody, and it's usually not going to be very good the longer it lasts. Dale, uh, we, we've heard from everybody here. Uh, let, let's give you an opportunity. You made very clear that your concerns, uh, that the athletes clear. Usually people say, well, we just want them to be quiet and play. You're yeah. saying, no, 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 that's just not going to happen. No, uh, I, I just go with what he said. Uh, <laughs> uh, whatever Pastor Hayes said, uh, I, I did that. I did that, I called it. Um, no, I, there's so much to, to talk about here, and, and you've taken all the fun out of this for me that we can't yell and cuss and scream at one another. Um, but, but I must say, and you've all touched on this at one level or another, um, uh, my best friend uh, uh, who, who did uh, fight in Vietnam, uh, no one said welcome him home because they brought him home in a box. Um, and and we, I think, would still be in Vietnam if people didn't protest that war. Hmm. If, if we didn't have people standing up and they were told, do not protest the war because you need to support the troops. We had the, that, that horrible phrase of love it or leave it in right. the 60s. And we eventually got out of Vietnam. Uh, 53,000 lives too late. But we get out of Vietnam. And I think it's one of the reasons that we're still fighting so many of the wars uh, in countries that, that uh, many of our leaders couldn't find on a globe. It's because we don't have people protesting that anymore. We have delivered this message that support the troops and we wrap ourselves in the flag. And, and I simply choose when I argue about this with Debbie or anyone else. First point simply is, as I wrote this commentary, as you remember, after the police shootings, and as I said then, uh, we, we should not support everyone in blue. We cannot support them all. And I've had police officer after police officer after police officer coming up to me thanking me for that. What bothers me most, and my brother-in-law is a retired police officer, I was at his house a few summers back and I heard the N-word from him and his, his police officer buddies more times than I've heard it in the last 20 years. And I finally got fed up with it trying to be the, the get-along brother-in-law and not a one of them in that room was racist. How dare I suggest that they were racist as they dropped the N-word talking about different things that had happened in their lives. My argument is you have the power of God strapped to your hip and you have the legal authority to use it. I believe our president would say you know what you signed up for. Wow. And I don't accept it then, I don't accept it now. We have to make a decision in this country that racism is real. And as I said in the commentary, the most recent one, if people don't understand that white privilege is a fact in America, mm -hmm. you don't understand America. Right. And when we then step back and say, to me, the bottom line is always protest, as you point out, is uncomfortable. Uh, I, I didn't do it. I, I probably will never kneel during the national anthem. Um, but I will never tell someone they can't because in the words of the great Molly Ivins, and I would submit this to the, I guess, the more conservative members of the panel. In the words of the great newspaper writer Molly Ivins, I would rather have someone who burns the flag and wrap themselves in the Constitution than someone who burns the Constitution hmm. and wraps themselves in, in the flag. flag. Right. Uh -huh. And I think that's where we are at now. I don't like it. It's not my place to like it. I don't even agree with doing it that way. That's not my place to agree. I think, I think Colin Kaepernick has succeeded because we're having this conversation That's right. now. That's right. The conversation is taking place all over America now. It's an uncomfortable conversation, especially if you have a badge and you carry a gun. Yeah. It's an uncomfortable conversation if you served in war and, and serve in the military. But it's a conversation that is about 50 years past due. Okay. And, and right. I, if I may say one last thing, because I know with Pastor here, I'm not ever going to get in again, and that's, and that's fine. <laughs> Seattle's receiver, and I love this line, uh, Seattle receiver Doug Baldwin right. said the other day, uh, when they were talking about, well, you know, we've made all this progress, we've made all, we've, we've made all these advances. Uh, I had a friend of mine, as I think you remember, Pastor, I mentioned this one time, uh, about, you know, affirmative action, for example. When do we stop this? When, when is that done? When do we do? And Doug Baldwin said, there is no, there is no limit, and there is no time limit on progress 
in America. And I think that's where we are. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We need to keep talking because we're nowhere close to what this country could and, and should be. <laughs> everybody <laughs> wants to hear something. I'm going to love to say something. The, the way we've constructed, I wanted to give everybody an opportunity to, 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 to respond. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, we're going to go to uh, Alicia. We're going to hear some of the, fa at least one of the <coughs> Facebook questions. And at that point, we're going to open up for everybody. You don't have to worry about me pointing at you, that sort of thing. Okay. Alicia, what do you have for us? <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of conversation centered around this, you know, as we predicted. Um, in the beginning, the question that we asked everybody on Facebook, we said, can your mind be changed on NFL players kneeling during the national anthem? We want you to listen to this conversation by you all and make your informed decision at the end. And in the beginning of the feed, we had a lot of people saying, no, my opinion is not going to change. This panel is not going to help me do so. But uh, the conversation has kind of altered, you know, as you guys have been talking. So that's really great. Um, a lot of people, though, have been saying, you know, NFL players, this is their job. So if you're not protesting at work, you're doing it in your own time. So why are these NFL players allowed to openly protest at work? You know, you've. Uh, Jack Brooks said, you've picked the wrong venue and moment in time for any protest. Just play ball. Leanna Tabber says, why are they allowed to openly protest? Do it in your own time. We've got a lot of people saying, just do this in your own time, but not when you're on the job. So I open that question to you guys. Okay. Well, well, let, go, go, go ahead. Then. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> thank you. You know, it was funny. One of the analogies I was thinking of was, you know, if you went into a grocery store and every single clerk had a shirt on that said, make America great again, most liberals would turn around and leave because they don't like that message. Or if they all had an I'm with her vote Hillary, a lot of conservatives would say, I'm not shopping in this store. These people are actually at work. These NFL players are at work. And when you're at work in every other arena in life, your boss gets to say, the uniform is this and not that. Even though this isn't a uniform thing, although I will point out the NFL would not let the Dallas Cowboys put a decal on their ha their helmets it's about the, the Dallas thing. police officers. It's not the same thing. But, right. it, it, but the concept is it's a message they're sending about America. And I think what they're understanding is yes, they have a constitutional right. Constitution only says you have the right to speak and the government can't arrest you. No one's getting arrested. No one's getting threatened to be arrested. So that's not, that's the constitutional issue is, is an aside. They have that right. What they're kind of saying is we have the right to do this, to make this statement that is many of the, their fans are finding offensive and they're bothered that people are offended. I mean, part of the constitutional right to speak is to recognize you're going to say things that offend people. And a lot of people feel offended by the failure to honor the flag, the national anthem. They feel like, you know what? Everyone knows this is our unifying theme. Stand up and honor it, and then we can have a discussion. And my last little point about the NFL folks, what they could do if I were advising them, at work, play your game, do what you're supposed to do, and every, all the fans are doing, and in the off season, which is the majority of the year, pick your three top causes and get out there because they are famous. If they can't, if they said we're going to fund, you know, police community relation town halls in the major cities, we're going to fund or we're going to promote all sorts of things to improve educational quality in low income neighborhoods so kids can get better jobs when they get out. There are a million causes to address the outcome of racism without disrupting the game. And I go back to my thing from the start. It's just sad because it's really dividing America. I don't think it's stimulating actual, honest respect for other people's views. I just think it's it's creating division with no message yeah, purpose. But, but it's only creating a division because of what Trump said in Alabama. No. This is, oh, oh no. yes, it is. No, 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 where, no. Clark, where were no. all your calls before? I, I never received no, an sir. email. No, no, so you were I, I you were so so offended. And so upset about Colin Kaepernick kneeling in San Francisco a year ago, not a single email to me, not ever a column written about people not going to games, not a single TV critic mentioning that ratings are down, which incidentally is not true about the ratings for football games because of the anthem. Not a single person. Trump goes to Alabama, calls the players <laughs> SOBs, and says they should be fired, and all of a sudden the conservative base rallied around him and made an issue out of something that was not an issue. It I, was not an issue. That's, that's not you know true. what? You that's don't live in the, I'm just telling you politely, it but you don't right. live in the conservative circles. People have been bothered since Colin Kaepernick, the very first time he did that. Conservatives are just saying, very what true. is he thinking? And all the other players following on, and then high school students, and then elementary school students following on, failing to respect the flag. It, I mean, I, whatever you think about Trump or don't yeah. think about him, the anger at, at the notion of disrespect of the symbol of America was already there. Okay. And that is, this anger is never channeled 
when Tamir Rice, 12 years old, mm -hmm. is shot in less than three seconds mm -hmm. from a police officer arriving on the scene. Where was the anger then? Where was the anger when we watched in real time Philando oh, Castile okay. as he's killed, mm -hmm. which is what prompted the uh, protest by Colin Kaepernick because he saw in real time uh, uh, Philando Castile as well as Alton Sterling in Louisiana get yes. killed. And again, no repercussions, no accountability, yeah. accountability whatsoever. So my concern is, conservatives, you're angry. I feel you on that. You want, you want respect. Can can you at least have that same anger when you see Tamir Rice, Jordan exactly. Edwards, and others get killed, and there's no accountability whatsoever? That's all we're asking. The this, answer this is yes. I would say that people across the political across the political spectrum have been demanding in all sorts of these cases. They want an investigation. They want to have the police uh, the police department looked at. This has not been like everyone's been silent until now. And so yes, I mean, anytime I think across racial and ethnic backgrounds and across political backgrounds, people want justice. They all do. They want justice. They want a sense of fairness. They want to challenge racism. This is, but they, and they do what they can about it, but this is a very public debate. And again, people have a simple avenue of saying, I'm turning off the NFL. Nobody I'm wants going. to see, nobody wants to see officers who commit crimes, and I would call that a crime, mm -hmm. commit yes. murder. Yes. Nobody wants to see officers be handled and go to trial and be served more than officers. Because we're the ones out in the street that are having to fight that uh, uh, ideology that we're out there shooting everybody. Thank you. I mean, let, let's, let's just use it here in Dallas with the uh, uh, body cameras. Nobody was more for the body cameras than the Dallas police officers themselves. Because it allowed us to finally have somebody who would speak our whole story. Not just the 10 seconds that was trimmed down from a video that somebody put on social media and made that, made that officer a villain for the rest of his life because it never goes away. Now we have the whole story what happened. But what <coughs> bothers me as a society is that one, we're losing, we're losing, because even here we're starting to go away from what the topic is. The topic is, is that life is being lost and nobody is really caring unless it ends up on social media. Two days ago, we had an individual that shot a mother in front of his six-year-old child, right in front of his face, shot her dead, and then went down, got in his car, drove into Pleasant Grove, and shot two people who had nothing to do with anybody and shot them in their front yard. That is a crime. That is a crime against society, but we don't hear about that. Why? Because it's south of I-30? That's wrong. Wow. No, but the whole society needs to treat life, all life, yeah. as important. Not me? just the Amen. 10 or 12. Please, please, well, 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 what I you, you hit on what? something real quick. Let me just for two seconds. We'll go to you, uh, the, we'll go to you Jen, and then we'll go to you. I have a the, question for hold on, the Hold on one second. Okay. The, the only issue, and, and I think that Pastor Haynes has highlighted this, is that if I walk out right now and shoot somebody, as educated as I am, as black as I am, as female as I am, as American as I am, I'm getting locked up and I'm getting convicted. The issue that we have is that when these officers are killing, right now I'm on pins and needles about Jordan Edwards because honestly I don't think he's going to get convicted. Right, right. I, I think Roy Oliver is going to walk after shooting a 15 year old and this is what, a week, maybe a week after he held a gun to, to, yeah. to two other people randomly. And guess what? His brother, brothers in blue could have had him off the street, but they didn't. They decided not to do anything with that previous incident. And that blue wall of silence is a problem because what you have is brothers protecting brothers. But the reason that we march isn't necessarily because we see this happening. It's because we see it happening and there is no accountability. Nothing happens. By the time it gets prosecuted, there's never a conviction. Can, you can't, buy, you you can't buy a conviction. Yeah, yeah, well, I, let, let, thank you. Thank you very much. I think, um, Dale, I think you're one of the greatest broadcasters. You're smoother than Tupelo Honey, but you're wrong about, you know, I, I deal with veterans every day. PTSD is real. And I love what this young lady said about it was an inconvenient way to protest that brought about I, I, that made me think, and I'm like, yeah, that's right. You know, I, I, I've never thought of it that way, but he used something that would bring attention. And thank you for bringing that to my insight. And I'm like, yeah, she's right. So um, 
but be don't be mistaken, Dale, and I, I, I think you're awesome, but you're wrong about that. When Colin Kaepernick kneeled, there was many people in my job and in my environment who said, I can't believe he did that. And they were, I talked to people in my office, I, I'm, a, I'm a veterans advocate and I work with veterans. And they tell me, do you, you see you know, him kneeling and they talked about it. It was in veteran circles and they cared about it. Well, so, yeah, I'm not saying no one cared about it. I'm saying not a single email in a year. There was no mention of well, television ratings going that, down. That there was no mention of people not going to games. I, I can't help it that not, you didn't get an email. Well, I'm saying somebody cares. Somebody cares about everything. You can yeah, find true. somebody that's who cares true, about everything. I'm saying well, this became something. a let me flaming hot the issue let me only the after the appearance of Alabama. I won't be Alabama. long, sir. You need to talk. I do a trauma-affected veteran course, and I teach police officers trauma-affected veterans through the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. And the neat thing about it is, is that we talk to law enforcement about how to deal with a veteran when you pull him over. So think about a veteran coming back from Afghanistan. He's fresh back to the United mm -hmm. States. Is he hypervigilant? Sure he is. Is he worried about his environment? He's just come back from there. Right. So we talked to law enforcement about how to recognize a veteran and how they deal with law enforcement. I think the conversation needs to be open to minorities in the black community. And I think we need to get a bunch of officers sitting around here and a bunch of black people sitting around there. And I want to have an open dialogue, one that helps them relate to one another. I'm, I'm serious. I want them to sit down and talk to one another and come up with a way. You know, I, I know, I know for a fact, I know what I'm talking about. You've got grandmother and grandfather who say to their young grandson, you better watch out for those police. And why do they say that? Because they grew up in the 50s and 60s and they remember when a black young black man complied with officers and he ended up getting taken out somewhere right that's really not the way it's done nowadays but yet they hear they hear these negative impulses from their family and the we can agree there's bad officers as well right Absol absolutely. but they're but the majority of officers and I know a lot of them I deal with them I teach them in the academy the trauma affected veteran course and I'm telling you, there are a bunch of good officers who want to do the right thing. They really do. Well, let me, let, I, let, let me yes, sir. I, I think we all agree most officers are good people. I think we all agree. What I'm, what I'm hearing from Jasmine is that when we come across a bad officer, the other officers defend the bad mm -hmm. officers. Yeah. We don't, we don't, I don't hear anything. There is and, a lot and, of that. I don't, I don't see, I think, let me also, I think, I think let me also add because I, that let, me, let me ask you something really quick. Cause see, well, you, me, can't, are, you can't deny well, that they're not clannish. Oh, no, no. I mean, I'm not, yeah. I'm not yeah. saying that. I am saying that the environment that officers work in now with body cameras and cameras everywhere, that ability to hold that blue line of silence is very, very difficult because now it's not you're going to get a slap on the hand and you're going to get fired. No, no, you're going to prison now. So, well, so what, what, when will that happen? Happen? Going see, to prison. What's that going to happen? Before, let this young man see what happened. Happened. Yes. Before body cameras, uh, let me mention this name, uh, Ronnie King. There was video, video, compelling video that showed those officers were in the wrong. Still no conviction. Uh, Walter Scott, they saw him running away, shot. Still no conviction. Uh, Eric Garner, no and the condition. police officer manipulating the crime scene. That's right, oh, right. Turning the cameras off and then yeah, planting that, evidence. That's a small but let me say this. Let me say this to you. Though. I heard In you say earlier. To the it's water. too much. Though. I heard you say that's earlier much. about you know uh, being welcome home. We come home to a totally different home than you do, sir. Mm -hmm. I really want you to understand. For years, uh, let's talk about these uh, 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 veterans from wars, World War One, World War Two, that came back and they're fighting for something that they couldn't even uh, uh, enjoy at their own home. That's what Muhammad Ali stood for. He said, "I have no problem with the Viet Cong. They ain't never called me no Negro or whatever, with using the other word." But in America, you and I have a different view. 
you're talking about Whitney Houston singing the national anthem and tears coming to your eyes. I'm talking about, I'm hearing, we shall overcome, we shall overcome. And I'm hearing Jordan Edwards at his funeral, people saying, precious Lord, take my hand. We have a totally different view. But that's now, a cultural, television, that's the a power, cultural power can seize nothing without demand, Frederick Douglass. And we know the power of television, because if it wasn't for Martin Luther King on the Sam Alabama uh, bridge, kneeling down before cameras, then who knows where the civil rights movement would yeah, have, would have gone true. to that's at that time. Yeah. Now, I ride with the Patriot Guard, so I bury soldiers three or four times a week. Soldiers who can't stand for themselves. On Wednesdays, the first Wednesday every month, we bury about 20 soldiers that have no family connection. And the most honorable thing that we can do is when we sit before that family, we fold that flag, we honor it, and we fold it, and we kneel mm -hmm. and hand it to them. Mm -hmm. Kneeling is, a, is humble. Is humbling yourself before something greater than mm -hmm. you. And this country is greater than all of us. And we all have blood, sweat, and well, tears here. Let me here. ask you one so, quick thing yes, as sir. a veteran. What do we do about the morale of veterans who serve overseas and who are gathered in a tent to watch Monday Night Football? And they're looking back and they say, that's the country I'm serving. But yet they see men kneeling without putting their hand over their heart. You don't think that affects morale? I mean, yeah, seriously, well, yes, you, you it does. don't think it does? It, it affects morale, but for At the average... expense of, in other words, Colin Kaepernick did it, in my view, right. at the expense of the morale of soldiers serving overseas, and we've been at war for over but, a decade. But, but we I come think back with a different... I think that's reprehensible. We have a different experience. When you come back, you can watch television, and you can say, well, you know, I fought for that, and, and he's dishonored. But when a black man, when I get off this uniform, when I, when I get out of this, I'm a black man. So when you're driving home, you're subject to get home 10 times more likely alive than I am. Today I was sitting in a place and my wife could tell you, I heard a knock at the door. I knew it was a police knock. And I got nervous and I don't have any warrants or anything. I just, I said, it's a police knock. And it was police. <laughs> and, and at that point, it, it gives myself, an, uh, I, I get attention, I get nervous. We suffered from PTSD before it was even thought about in, in the military. But let me ask what you, that, you, had in, that in at, you had that officer at your door. Was he disrespectful to you? Well, he wasn't at our door. He was at a door of a, of a uh, we were at Baylor, Scott and White, somewhere doing some, uh, you know, uh, outreach. No, he wasn't disrespectful, but the fact that I heard the knock but, but that's, and the authority but, of that knock, I got nervous. Okay, but that takes time. That takes time to heal old wounds, new wounds, for officers to come into a new uh, environment, a new profession. Can we heal Jordan Edwards' wound? But that's my point. We have to move forward in training and getting officers to understand that. Now, I want to talk one thing about what Dale said. He said, we signed up for this. I've got a problem with that because I signed up to protect and serve. You're absolutely right. Did I, think there was, did I know there was going to be a danger? Yeah, I did. But I didn't sign up to be a marriage counselor. I didn't sign up to tell Johnny he needs to do his homework. I didn't sign up for being a mental health officer. The mental health system has uh, betrayed the patients, oh. a lot of people coming back from the military. You have a federal government who has not lived up to their end of the bargain in the health care system. You have a health care system that has not lived up to their bargain for the mental health. And then we have officers who are being called out to a scene to deal with somebody who's schizophrenic, bipolar, any of those manic depressive uh, uh, illnesses and what are we charged to do? Place handcuffs on them and put them in the back of a cage in a squad car and transport them to jail and they think something positive is going to come out of that. The majority of, of incidents where officers have to go hands-on nowadays is because of the large amount of uh, drug addiction and mental health. But and I, but we I, are not but trained. That we get as, but 16 I never heard that hours in of training. Case. I, never, I never heard that exactly. in, in the yeah. Jordan Edwards case. The, the, I, 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 I agree with you 100%. I, I believe, I, I may be wrong on this, but there's no question that the, the most, the biggest mental health systems in the state of Texas are the jails. No question right. about that. But the jail had nothing to do with the, but John, the cases but John, that you're, you're talking about. John, you're acting like I'm making, a, I'm making an excuse for those. Absolutely oh, no, not. No. We have incidences where officers broke the law. And when that happens, they need to go to court. But they're not, and that's the problem. But let I me understand ask you, that. sir, how many, that's officers, why Black Lives how many matter, officers went to work that night across the United States and did their job? That's my point. We have 600,000 officers Thank across you. this country. Yep. There's a now, percentage any, of any, okay, any here, here, loss here. of life is way too many. Exactly. But to say that there is a systemic 
uh, uh, police officer agenda that we are out there killing innocent people every day is not true and it 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 tears the fabrics of the community what bought what breaks my heart the most is when i go someplace and i still am on the street answering calls on deep nights and i'll go some way and a an adult will tell their child don't talk to him he's going to take you to jail or you better do what i say or that officer is going to put you in prison we're perpetuating this idea that the cop, that the police are the enemy, and, 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 and at one, one time one quick, they one, were. One, one quick comment: I stood ten feet away from the first officer that was shot on, on uh, July seventh. Ten feet away from him, I watched him drop. I watched him roll his body over. And I will say this: those officers ran towards the danger, and they didn't care what color we were. They protected all lives. And I, so I will say that. I, I, I just want to throw that out there. You want to Let think me just one to, oh, okay. go ahead. No, Let him, please. Let him oh. talk, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll just say this. One of the things that concerns me is that, again, we have a way of moving away from uh, the original issue. point. The narrative keeps hopping here and there. I don't think you'll find anyone who will say we see the police as en enemies. We don't want to see the police as enemies. When we find ourselves in trouble, we want to feel You're free calling. to call exactly. for 911 knowing that we're going to be protected. Exactly. Uh, I've said, you know, we want you to have our back. We want to have your back. We want a partnership. We, we do not want to feel that we are being preyed upon. And so, yes, you may be right. It's not happening every day, but uh, the latest stats I get is that every 20 eight hours someone is getting shot by a police officer the vast majority are black so I'm not saying that it's a racist system I'm just saying there are racist racial consequences that come from a system that evidently needs to be addressed my brother right here said something that I hope we all will hear and I really appreciate that in terms of the trauma experienced by veterans and some have made a statement around this table about the trauma that we feel wants, exactly. when, when I'm driving along and there's a police car behind me, I am praying, God, is this the last time for me? Yeah. I shared an open letter at my church, and I never talk about this, that me and my best friend while in college got stopped in front of prestigious First Baptist Church downtown Dallas, and we were disrespected, uh, called names we should not have been called, and we had just worshipped at First Baptist because as college students we wanted to have that experience of worshiping at prestigious First Baptist, W.A. Criswell, the pastor. We had a wonderful worship and what hurt me was when that man had us on the, had, had, when, when, when I was on the ground, knee in my back, handcuffed because I looked like someone who, who, who they were trying to get, which is why Philando Castile got killed, by right, the way. Right. Uh, so I'm on the ground, handcuffed, been called all kind of names after worshiping. I'm in a suit, so really, out, out the door goes the politics of respectability, because I'm in a suit, having just worshiped at First Baptist Church. Man calls me all kind of names, along with my best friend, and then to make matters worse, people just walk by Nobody and cares. say absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Coming out of church. Do you feel, still feel that same way now? I feel when I get stopped, I'm afraid something may and go wrong. And he's as close to God as Daniel. Well, you know what? Okay? I'm sorry that happened to you. <laughs> and, and again, I, I'm sorry for, for that me, that's PTSD. You. Sure, and yeah. I can understand yeah. that. But Which, I've got, and I need you to teach the police. I, but I've got to, I, I would love to ask Dale, do you think that what happened with Kaepernick and him first sitting and then kneeling. Do you think it's gotten way away from that in the NFL? I mean, in terms of the message, uh, away from what? in what? In, in other words, um, you know, Trump has, excuse me, President Trump has interjected his thoughts, yeah. and yeah. now you have the Cowboys. This most recent game, mm -hmm. all standing, and it's turned into this big circus. Do you think it's gotten away from the original message? Oh, I think it has, but I think it's coming back. Uh, oh, I, 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 I think, unfortunately, it had to take this ugly turn to refocus the original argument. Uh, because, and again, we can agree to disagree forever. Uh, I heard very little about this. Uh, after, Colin, I mean, after Colin Kaepernick first took the knee, it was shocking. But it's also much like you know the airplanes landing uh, safely at the airport. We don't report on those. We report on the one that crashed. Yeah, right. And we, we grill the pilot if he survives. And uh, So like the police officers, you mentioned the 6,000. I get that. I get that. We don't report on those. We report on the ones who mess up. Mm -hmm. Colin Kaepernick started his protest. There was this big flash storm. It may well be in, in your conservative circles, as you point out, Debbie. But I'm an open book. 
and I'm not saying it's a scientific study by any means, but I didn't have, in the last year, I didn't have uh, 10 emails because I didn't have five, because I didn't have any. And people write me about a whole lot of stuff. Not one in the past year, not a single email complaining to me about what are we going to do, now, what do you, about these what needy do you players. What do you attribute that? To, 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 the, to the speech in Alabama, without yeah. question. Right. It, it, it was same time, fading away. At the same, yeah, I think it was going away. Gas, the most, yeah. right? He poured yeah. gas on it. Can, can At that up? time, everybody got riled up. And now I really do believe that this is um, almost backwards a, a good thing. Because now it has refocused the issues. It's given Colin Kaepernick and people who support him the opportunity to reinforce what the so-called protest is actually about. And we're having something, although it's albeit a small crowd, we're having something that resembles a civil conversation. And hopefully, although I don't hold a lot of hope for this, that something positive will come out of this. But I think we've refocused the argument. I think that's a good thing. Go ahead, Dan. Go ahead, Dan. You know, I think it'd be a great thing for the Players Association to do because my two main complaints about this is, as I said earlier, it's, a, it's an overly broad, it's interpreted by the public as an overly broad accusation that all of America is a horrible, terrible, racist place. And most Americans are saying, we are so much better than that. We're not saying we're perfect. We can look at the instances you've mentioned, other ones, and say, yes, we're not perfect. We have to work, be better. We have to improve our justice system. We have to improve our policing. We have to work on these things. No one is saying just ignore the problem. Everyone agrees there's some problem, but it feels like a broad accusation So be against a lot of people who are saying, I'm not guilty of that, and that I don't know anyone who is. But would it be a great thing if the Players Association wanted to say, for example, here are the three issues we're going to work on off-season. We're going to get, uh, whatever, town halls. We're going to work on the, improving the education system so we don't have so much income inequality, which is being mentioned by some of the players, the disparity in wealth in America, the, the, uh, the struggling inner cities. You could do a lot of things that send a message that we want all of us of every race and ethnicity and political background to come together so and work on to these things. That would yes. feel... Yeah, you wanted to be comfortable. Well, you know what? The thing is, the, thing is, this is, this the, is the, the best justifier because what, what they're saying is just making people just, just step back and say, you know, I don't want to hear this because you're calling me something I don't deserve. Yeah, but well, no, like don't no, what, 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 Forgive me, I, 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 I should have made a note about this, but there's a great term for the, the individual example of what I'm going to use. But I, I'm going to try to find my emails, and if we would when we're done here, give me your email address, and I will send you the emails from people who are incredibly offended at me for just exactly what you said, that I have referred to their dog whistle to the racist line mm -hmm. because they're not racist, as they use the N-word, as they mm -hmm. said, thank goodness they can play football because all these boys would be locked up. That's mm -hmm. all they're good for is raping mm -hmm. and beating women, mm -hmm. as they've used uh, uh, some uh, of the... Uh, no, hold on a second. I I'm no not saying it's a scientific study. No one. Ha have you ever There's met there. anybody who's a racist? Do you know anybody who has said to you, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, you, I'm kind of sorry you brought that up, because actually I am a racist. No one says that. No. No one says that. George Wallace didn't think he was racist. Right. He just locked down the university doors and demanded segregation forever. But if you buy him a drink and say, you know, you're kind of a racist, George. I guarantee you, George Wallace would have looked at you and said, no, not me. I just believe in states' rights. I believe in individual freedoms, opportunities. No one of that ilk, and I'll send you email after email after email that will make you sick if you do understand You know what, issue, Dale, I, once again, not. I disagree with you. You, well, under, send them to you, you too, underestimate right? the white race. There is a bunch of people. I'm talking about a large faction of people. I'm not talking well, about just a just little bit. just as offended as, as yes. you are. Yes. You underestimate the white race. Oh, this about. is yes. Yeah, you underestimate us protests. as a people to be, to be compassionate and understanding to these shootings. I think you underestimate the white race. Because you got some emails from some Dallas society that that loves to yeah, talk because like they don't that. count. See, that's the great well, no, See, I'm just their saying, opinions don't do count. Do you think the majority of society is sending you emails? No, I said hell no, no, they're not. But so I'm supposed and to ignore the 30 percent? Man, I'm but telling you, think, what do you think? You underestimate you think us to be a compassionate no, no, no. people. But, but Trust you, me, we but don't what underestimate what you. you. Don't <laughs> what you don't realize is this supposedly is about the flag. And you literally just stated we as the white race. So seemingly the only people that are oh, so I can't I can't call out my own race. No, you no, can, but I can't. No, 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 no. But it 
to me, the way that I received it, and it may not have been how oh, you planned. Oh, please. Come on now. Plan. That's was what. That's only, the problem wait, is, wait, is wait, I can't wait, say wait. white no, race, no, no, no. but you can say black no, race. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that it almost seemed as if you were saying well, that the only so. people that are offended by the protest are white people. Right. No, and I didn't it, say that. No, and I'm saying no. that that's how I received she it. Said and that's if I, oh, I'm sorry and, and, that and you received saying. it that way, and, and I apologize you I, received it that okay, way, but that because, is not the way I meant Because that was going to be a problem. But, well, Debbie, one thing that I did want to say to you as a woman, as a, as a female attorney at that, if you were wanting to protest, say, a, a women's rights issue, and a group of men sat down and told you, now, Debbie, honey, we need you to do it in this way at this time. How would you feel about that? Would you would you be okay with someone telling you when and how you should exercise your right to free speech as yeah. it relates to your women's yeah. rights issue? If I was at work, I would know I couldn't do it at work. That's the answer. If this protest was they happening can. in the other other it's eight months of the year, it'd be a whole different thing. This is at work. This is them at work in my law firm. I don't not work now, but my law firm in California. If I had tried to take the stage in the middle of litigation and make a big women's protest rights, they would say, stop and do your job. This is this is part of the reason. And I gotta say one huge thing about the flag, which I hope is unifying. And you were said earlier what the flag stands for, and what the pledge, what America stands for. This is the only way people of various races, ethnicities, national origins, political backgrounds and viewpoints can right, ever right. unify is around the idea of America. That's why I talk about my radio show all the time. It's not saying America's perfect. It's not saying that there is no racism ever. But the idea of America is the most <laughs> unifying, Debbie, profound idea. Question, and, if you, and if you give the, the back of the hand to the symbol yeah. of America, you're saying that I reject the one unifying can thing I, there is. Can I ask is. you a question? Absolutely. Let's, you know let's the say term. Earnest question, then, and then we'll ask. Okay. Do you know where the term redneck came from? I know what it means. I don't know where it came from. No. Well, it actually came from a protest of labor unions in, uh, in Virginia, Virginia, West Virginia. And they wore red scarves to say that we are a part of the union. That's a workplace protest. And if they had not done that, they would not, uh, they would have been dying inside of mountains and, 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 and there was no safety, uh, 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 safety measures to protect them. Good. So that's where the term redneck came from. They wore red scarves wrapped around their neck <clears throat> because of the labor unions. Labor unions have always been the They're place of getting equality. Even Absolutely. when you find out that out of your firm that you may be the lowest paid attorney there, because and what are you gonna female. do? Because, because you're a female. What are you gonna do? You're gonna wait to Christmas, uh, uh, you know, Christmas vacation to talk about it? Let, let me, uh, <laughs> let, let, Alicia, let me, let me ask you, I'm sure you've uh, gotten a lot of people that have been, <laughs> have some questions they want to ask us. Let's go ahead. We've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to make sure that we get everybody an opportunity to respond and to talk. Yeah, well, we were hoping for a lot of questions, but, um, you know, as I said in the beginning, a lot of people in the comment section have been saying, no, my opinion is not going to change, um, and, and that still holds true now. But, you know, we know it's really hard to get people to budge these days, you know, if they're very firm on one side or the other. My question for the panelists would be, what would you recommend is a good common ground for these people that are so strong on both sides of the issue? What what would you, advice would you give them? Is there some... Uh, May I respond to that? Uh, I like that. Renita Williams is a brilliant scholar, and she says, when you interpret scripture, we see from where we stand. I think that principle applies right here. I'm seated right here, and, and what I see is in front of me. And I think all of us come from various experiences and we see this issue from where we stand. So there are some who, when they're watching the protest in a foreign land, who are, vet, who, who are, are serving, uh, they see exactly <coughs> as you say. Uh, they see offense. There are others who see they are standing up for why I'm fighting. We see from where we stand. And what Dale has done that I'm praying that all of us will learn by way of how we improve and make this country what it should become. And that is maybe I should get out of my seat so I can see what you see. Feel what you feel. As long as we stay in our respective seats, we're only going to see from where we stand. And the sad reality is we have locked into where we sit and where we stand. And as a consequence, it's hard for the nation to move forward. I think Dale has the example. And again, the parable of the Good Samaritan is what? As a matter of fact, to finish my story about what happened at First Baptist, it was a wonderful white worshiper who finally approached the police and said, why are you doing this to them? They just 
just finished worshiping with us. He used his privilege yes. as a white yes. person yes. to confront what he saw was an injustice. He basically left where he stood, his comfortable position, in order to basically confront the police yeah. and the police set us That's free. That's what Dale was saying. Well, my, 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 my wife actually said this about me. It's one of the nicest things she said in the 40 years or so I've known her. Um, I, I will listen. Uh, and I will change my mind if you convince me. Uh, and if somebody ever does that, I, I promise I will. Uh, uh, I've just never been wrong yet, but it's bound to happen. I'm just, it, but but it, is, it is an argument, and as Pastor Haynes knows, and my friend Judge Boyer and others will know, I try to challenge myself every day. I don't want to live in my bubble. Yeah. Um, and I think we have chosen upsides. Um, not this particular table. But so many of us in America have chosen upsides that we know we're right. Oh, I believe I'm right. I, I know you believe you're right, you're right, you're right. We all believe we're right. But I promise you, I spend a lot of my social hours with people who disagree yeah. with me. Because I don't need affirmation. Yeah. That same lovely wife of mine gave me a picture of Jack Nicholson blowing a, a smoke circle out of his cigar. And he said, I am who I am. I do not need your affirmation. <laughs> And I'm sitting there going, why would you give that to me? <laughs> but, but I'm very comfortable in this, this fat skin of mine. But every friend that I have, and I lost friends over this anthem uh, uh, protest uh, commentary, by the way. Not friends worth having, quite honestly, but I lost them. Hmm. And what I am simply saying is, uh, every opportunity I get... Uh, I, I try to get someone to sit with me and puff a cigar and sip a little wine who disagrees with me. Because mm -hmm. I don't need Pastor Haynes uh, to tell me I'm right, uh, although I can listen to him talk forever. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't need you to tell me I'm right. I would prefer to sit with people to tell me I'm wrong. And on occasion, believe it or not, I do change. I do learn something that I did not think about. I, I just don't ever let McKay and other people at Channel 8 know about it. <laughs> let me... Uh... Uh, we've, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I, I think that we have hit... See, to me, this has always been a moral argument. For it to be, not a political argument. The problem, I think, with what we heard out of the White House and some other places, was that it became a political argument. Mm -hmm. But if it's a moral argument, what happens is what we're hearing, and that is that we must step out of where we are uh, and, and examine the people who play on our team, so to speak. In other words, uh, and what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing uh, from Jasmine and what I'm also hearing from Ernest is they want to see one instance where a police officer has done something wrong and other officers publicly state, no, 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 we're not going to support that at all. Right. What we normally hear is no one says anything. And I will say this, and what I think the police officers are saying, and I have seen this on video myself and seen live pictures myself, we had a protest out here at the, uh, the Confederate Cemetery or what, what, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But I remember hearing some of the protesters screaming at officers who were on horseback, and this is a quote, animals get off the horses. Mm -hmm. And I did not hear one person uh, who was in support of the protest say to those individuals, you know what, that's mm -hmm. not what we that's stand for. Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Haynes can back me up on this. If you take a look at the civil rights protests of the past, they truly, they truly took a look at the people who were going to be joining in those mm -hmm. protests. Oh, yeah. They said, you got to protest, you got to protest this way. If you want to do this, you can't be with us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hearing, from what I'm hearing from everybody here is, this, if we want this to be a moral argument, then we really have to step out of who we are. Yeah. And that's not a pleasant thing. No. Well, because it's hard that, to do. That, it's hard to do. It's, really? it's, it's hard. To, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's not an easy thing to do. But what I'm hearing is that from everybody. Um, we've uh, got maybe about 90 seconds left. I can't, I'm, I'm trying to look at who I, I was, could talk I to in 90 seconds. seconds. I was going to say one seconds. thing about stepping outside <laughs> is that um, I am seen as, as the attorney that's going after law enforcement um, because that's what I've been doing a little bit of. But I will tell you that a lot of my closest friends are actually law enforcement officers. And when things happen, I actually sit down and I talk with them. And I tell them, this is why I see a problem. Do you see a problem? If so, what problem do you see? Now, I will tell you that I haven't run into one officer that actually believes that what Roy Oliver did was right. And they actually are hoping that he is convicted as relates to Jordan Edwards, and they have been very vocal about that. But they've explained to me issues with training. For instance, I have a training officer that told me that when they went through, when he was administering training, 
that the villains were always black. Yeah. They didn't even realize like the like the villains when they've got to shoot people, they ended up being black until he actually said something and said, "Listen, you've got to change this because subconsciously That's a these officers problem. exactly." <laughs> and let me say something. We have more things in common than different. I'm a kidney transplant. On 4th of July, I received a kidney transplant. Do you think I asked what race the guy was? Mm -hmm. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. God created us where we have interchangeable parts. We have more things alike than different. Yeah. That's true. And I'd like to add on to that. I think the vast majority of Americans, again, all races, all ethnicities, religions, backgrounds, want the same thing. I just, I think that's part of this problem of the protest is the sense that, that maybe people think that there are people who don't care about the racial challenges we have. People, no one's claiming the country's perfect. Nobody's claiming that. I just, and I think there's just far more commonality in the notion we all want a better, good country. We want to have police officers you know, doing the perfect thing every time or as close as we can get and, to and that. that's there's what no England said before we created America. We want everything <laughs> just fine. I just want to say, I just want to say one last thing. And I don't, uh, can't remember exactly who said it, but I promise you, I taught at the academy for six and a half years. And 99% of those officers who came in civilians in their dresses and their suits came in for the right reasons, to protect Amen. the public. Amen. And they still answer those calls every day to do the right thing. Are there bad situations? Absolutely. And do we need to handle those situations appropriately? And those people need to go to jail? Absolutely. But time and time again, 1.3 million times, officers go out there and to save everybody. They don't care what color they are. They don't care if they're the bad guy or the good guy. The bad guy burning up in the car, they go and rush into them to save them too. And when Dale said we signed up for that, he's wrong. We no, no, you know I'm being flippant there. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Did my, sarc right. did my sarcasm yeah. fly yeah. right I'm past you there? He was being sarcastic. But let me make my point. My point is... You give me that one, don't you, Clark? Yes, My point is is that the one thing we signed up for is to make this life, this world better. Every one of us, because we sure didn't sign up to be millionaires. Right. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> and, and that's what the protesters are doing. Yeah. They've signed up to make this country better. Mm -hmm. And my concern is that if your foot is on my neck, you can't tell me how to scream. Exactly. Give me the opportunity to get up, but also give me the right to say, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And when you give me that opportunity, then we all rise. The beautiful thing about this country is, Protests have always made America better, yeah. even, it, even when it was inconvenient. What he Dr. said. Dr. King even said this. <laughs> Dr. What King he said. said yeah. There was a creative tension that brought about the victories in the civil rights struggle. So it, it, it was very tense. It, it was not comfortable. It was not night. Everybody feeling good. Kumbaya. Mm -hmm. No, it was tense. Mm -hmm. But through that tension, truth emerged, yeah. and America experienced what William Barber calls a second reconstruction. Mm -hmm. John, the last thing I want to say is we just want to make sure there has to be the right time and the place. When you're getting pulled over and somebody's issuing you a citation, that is not the time to fight and argue. Oh, yeah. Your no, time to right. fight and argue yeah. is in the court. You want to live. Yeah. 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 You know? yeah. But that's uh, my point. Uh, everybody, and let me, let me point out, everybody here out. will agree with that. Every, Let's kick out all the bad guys. Yeah, Sorry. everybody seems to me will agree with that. I, I'm looking particularly at the two attorneys. You can always find, we'll just take care of it on the side and take my ticket. Yeah. We can always find an attorney who can handle that problem. I think I get general agreement from that from everybody. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, let me, uh, I appreciate all of your being here. I, I, I know that uh, it got a little, a little heated. That's all right. That, that, that's, that's, that's a good thing. It was healthy. Uh, most people in this country have no clue to what it's like to live in some other country. I, I have lived in another country. Uh, and I have seen what can happen when, uh, when the police officers, the, the entire department, doesn't have to worry about what they do to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the good thing about what we're doing here tonight to me is that we are all holding each other accountable. A and even though Dale and I have been in the media for a long time, I, I would urge people to continue to have these kinds of discussions, quite frankly, with no cameras around, yeah. with, no, uh, with nobody taking notes, but just the t with people, as Dale said, who, with whom you may disagree. But the more discussions you have like that, uh, that are sincere and honest, uh, the better it's going to be. It's not going to be perfect. It's not a perfect country. Uh, and some, as my father used to tell me, it's not a fair country. Um, but we're going to work to make it more fair. Yeah. I appreciate all of you being with us tonight. Uh, I think uh, we appreciate your audience for being with us. It would be nice if we could have more of these, wouldn't it, rather than talk about 
the Kardashians and all that. <laughs> <laughs> Garbage, it doesn't matter. Yeah, sure. I just want to say, I'll see you here to tomorrow then. Talking to each other matters so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you.